Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the part two of season three in the KO International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium. I'm Sung Hun Lee from International Christian University. Today, we have two exciting talks by Julia Stanton from New York University and Amanda Riesling from University of California at Santa Cruz. This event is co-hosted with uh, Shigeto Kawahara uh, at KU University. I'm happy to introduce you to Dr. Julia Stanton, an assistant professor of linguistics uh, at New York University. She received her PhD in linguistics uh, from Massachusetts Institute of MIT. Uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in 2017. Her work focuses on phonological typology, phonetics and phonology interface, and also uh, how uh, uh, phonological representation work and uh, their analyses of this. She has worked on various topics, including the dissimulation in Sundanese and nasal cluster dissimulation in Gurindji. Uh, her work has been published in uh, Phonological Data and Analysis, Journal of Linguistics, Phonology, and Glossa, among others. It's good to have you here at the KU ICU link today. And uh, Juliet will talk about uh, phonetic rhythm in ization. Hey, um, thank you for that introduction. So I'm going to share my handout now. Um, everybody can see my handout, right? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, so it's commonly assumed that stress is the manifestation of linguistic rhythm. And when we talk about rhythm, this implies alternation or the time succession of weak and strong beats. In English, we have rhythmic alternation at a couple of levels. So we can find rhythmic alternation at the phrase level. So if you read aloud the phrase 27 Mississippi legislators, um, there's an alternation of weak and strong beats that occurs throughout that phrase. Um, rhythmic alternation is also found at the word level. So in a word like reconciliation, here we get here again, we have this alternation between strong and weak beats. So strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak. Alternation for its turn implies distance. So weak and strong beats are separated in time. And the major question that I want to address in this talk is how do we measure rhythmic distance? Now, the way in which rhythmic distance is measured um, differs according to whether you're assuming a foot-based or a foot-free approach to stress. So the way distance is measured in recent or constraint-based, um, foot-based approaches to stress kind of goes like the following. There are constraints like parse syllable that require syllables to be parsed into feet. And then there are constraints on foot form and alignment that regulate the distance between stresses. So basically, it's how these syllables are parsed into feet and how the feet are kind of align with respect to one another that regulate how far stresses are from one another. And recent or constraint-based foot-free approaches to stress, um, there are constraints like star lapse and star clash that directly regulate the distance between stressed and stressless syllables. So star lapse is a constraint that doesn't want stresses to be too far apart. So it assigns a violation for each sequence of two adjacent stressless syllables. Star clash is a constraint that doesn't want stresses to be too close together. So it assigns a violation for each sequence of two adjacent stressed syllables. Um, kind of when you put them together, they prefer a type of rhythmic alternation where you have stressed, stressless, stressed, stressless. And so these constraints are often referred to as rhythmic constraints because they promote rhythm. So these foot-based and foot-free approaches are superficially different. But they share something very fundamental, which is that they calculate distance over units of formal structure, that is syllables and feet. Um, in this talk, what I would like to do is explore an alternative, namely rhythm is calculated not over units of formal structure, but in, over duration in a much more direct way. So there's an outline at the bottom of this page that's there um, for your benefit. You can free to peruse it, but um, to keep my talk under the time limit, I'm going to go ahead and skip to the top of page two, and I'm going to start talking about the topic of interest here, which is how stress works and where words that end in ization. So our interest here is that in American English, words that end in ization vary in whether or not eyes bear stress. And you can see this immediately from a look at the OED. So the OED transcribes um, some words that end in ization as consistently having a stress. So these are words like solarization, limitization. It transcribes some as never having a stress on eyes. So this is something like fascization or functionalization. So notice the schwa there instead of the eye. 
And then it transcribes um, in some cases that I stress is variable. So according to the OED, you can have either relativization or relativization. You can have serialization or serialization. So before I start talking about what conditions this variability, it's necessary to first review some more general properties of stressinization to answer a couple questions, namely, what are the factors that are disfavoring or favoring stress on eyes? Kind of why in a very general way are we seeing this variation in the first place? So for this, it's useful to separate words that indenization into two domains. One is the stem or all of the material that precedes isation. And the second is the suffixal domain, which I'm assuming is composed of three separate suffixes, eyes, eight, and young. And for right now, we just need a couple of assumptions to illustrate why stress on isation varies. So I'm going to assume here that stress on eyes is compelled by a suffix specific constraint that is stress eyes. This is in seven, and it assigns a violation if the suffix eyes doesn't bear stress. Now, if you stress eyes, we know that the suffix eight in Asian is invariably stressed. So stressing eyes in eight violates star clash. We can thus see eyes de-stressing as a kind of clash avoidance strategy. So you don't want to stress eyes in eight because then you would have two adjacent syllables that are stressed. The fact that the outcome of class, clash resolution is isation rather than something like isation, I'm going to assume is due to star lapse right. This is a positional constraint that assigns a, a, um, a violation if neither of the final two syllables is stressed. And if star lapse right dominates stress eyes, we can then understand why it's the stress of eyes that varies. So um, kind of summarizing all of what I've just said in tableau form, we have nine here. So um, the form serialization is just out because this violates star lapse right, eight is not stressed. And then we have um, the possibility of either serialization, that's candidate A, or serialization, that's candidate B. And so if star clash dominates stress eyes, we would have serialization because here it's more important to avoid a clash than it is to stress eyes. And if stress eyes dominate star clash, we would have serialization because here it is more important to stress eyes than it is to avoid a clash. So then the question becomes, can we predict when eyes is more or less likely to bear stress or is this variation just random? And um, to kind of look into whether or not um, rhythmic factors are implicated as I uh, thought they might be from some previous work, I did a corpus study um, containing so that comprised um, all isation forms that were in the OED as of February a couple of years ago. Here um, I counted the inner suffix as stressed if eyes is transcribed as eyes with a diphthong um, and the inner suffix is stressless if eyes is transcribed as a schwa or an i. So these are the reduced vowels that the OED uses for American English. In the case that it was variable, I assigned these to the stressed category um, but this was just to facilitate the statistics and doesn't affect the results. So if you look at 10, there's a really clear rhythmic effect in isation stress. Um, I stress is much more frequent than it when it resolves a lapse than when it creates a clash with the stem. So just walking through 10 now, um, we have words like concretization or concretization. And in cases like this, where eye stress would introduce the clash with the stem, we find that the OED records eye stress about 64% of the time. Um, in words like channelization or channelization, where eye stress um, uh, resolves a violation of lapse and might otherwise result, we find that eyes is stressed at a much higher rate, about 94% of the time. And in cases where eye stress would ameliorate a violation of star extended lapse, so star extended lapse is a constraint that forbids sequences of three stressless syllables, um, we have eye stress at a rate of about 99%. So basically, the further the rightmost stem stress is away from the eyes, the more likely you are to have eye stress. And a logistic regression finds a significant difference between the clash and the lapse contexts, as well as the lapse and the extended lapse context. So these differences in 10 are real. Um, and just to answer some questions that might be lurking in some of your minds, um, factors that were not included in this model in, um, included things like derivative and base frequency. 
Um, so the frequency of the ization derivative and the frequency of the eyes base um, do not seem to make a difference in whether or not eyes is stressed. In addition, the identity of the final segment, so whether it's an S versus another segment, doesn't seem to matter. So you might be wondering why I'm talking about this. I will come back to it later. For now, I want to focus on the fact that if we take a pretty detailed look at the data, um, there is variance within subrhythmic categories. So specifically, looking at the clash context, what I want you to notice in 11 is that the rate of eye stress varies according to the interstress material, namely according to which consonants are between the two stresses. So in a word like um, xenization or xenization, we find eyes stressed about 53% of the time. In a word like stylopization, right, which is transcribed as stylopization, we find eyes stressed about 61% of the time. In a word where there's a stem final cluster, so something like baptization, um, we find eyes stressed 77% of the time. Um, so clash is kind of the special context here. Um, the rate of eye stress doesn't vary noticeably within the lapse and extended lapse contexts, but if you look back up at 10, this isn't so surprising because these numbers are already pretty close to the ceiling. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, my hypothesis is that eye stress is sensitive to duration, and the longer the distance is between the rightmost stem stress and eyes, the more likely eyes is to be stressed. Analytically, this is equivalent to a claim that eye stress is governed by a phonetic version of star clash. If this is correct, then we might expect a couple of things to hold given the dictionary data that we've just seen. The first is that as the number of syllables between the rightmost stem stress and eyes increases, so should the duration between that rightmost stem stress and eyes. So just kind of plotting out what this should look like, um, the sh in fascization, right, where there's not much material between the rightmost stem stress and eyes, um, should be shorter than the null in channelization. And this should in turn be shorter than the dural in federalization. Okay. This might seem really obvious, um, you know, if we have more material, if we have more syllables, this should mean more duration. However, there have been reports in in the literature that kind of hint at the existence of lapse compression in English. So maybe when there's more stressless materials, people speed up. So this prediction should be verified rather than just assumed. In addition, given the finding that we find more isation stress across a cluster than across an obstruent than across a sonorant, we might expect that clashes with sonorant should be shorter than clashes, clashes with obstruents, hence the lower rate of eye stress and that clashes with obstruents ought to be shorter than those with clusters, hence the shorter rate of, sorry, since the, hence the lower rate of eye stress in clashes across an obstruent. So in order to know whether or not this hypothesis is right, we need to know whether or not trends in the dictionary data correlate with trends of duration, and also whether or not speakers' preferences match these trends. So to test the hypothesis, I conducted a forced choice task asking people to choose between ization and ization variants of a form, as well as a production task. And what I'm about to show you is that overall, um, both sets of results converge on the same conclusion, namely speakers are sensitive to duration and use this when they're producing or judging an ization form. So for the experiment, sorry about that, um, I recorded recorded one speaker producing ization and ization variants of forms that ended in ization, all of them place names or demonyms. So you can see these in table one. Um, I included 10 items where I stress would violate clash, so it would introduce a clash with the stem. So these were forms like progization. So if you have progization, um, you have the stem stress clashing with the eyes. I had 10 items where I stress would satisfy star lapse. So this was something like um, cubanization. So in cubanization, there's a stress lapse, but if you stress the eyes, cubanization, it goes away. And then finally, I had 10 items where eye stress would satisfy star extended lapse. So these are forms like providenceization, um, where if you stress eyes, you have providenceization, which has a lapse rather than an extended lapse. Um, within these categories, as you can see from table one up here, the segmentals following the rightmost stem stress differed. Um, so this was introduced as a way to kind of vary the duration of these forms. Um, 
So the durational properties of these forms, if we kind of take a look at how the speaker pronounced all of these, um, are in line with the predictions above. So we find that the distance from the rightmost stem stress to the I suffix is shortest in the clash context, longer in the lapse context, and longest in the extended lapse context. And you can see this pretty clearly here in figure one. So if you replace zero with clash, one with lapse, and two with extended lapse, you can see that as we go from clash to lapse to extended lapse, the duration of the inner stress material increases. Okay. Um, second thing, sorry about this. Okay, second thing we find is that um, sonorants between two stresses appear to be maybe slightly shorter than obstruents, which are shorter than clusters. And you can see this in figure two, which is at the bottom of page four. Okay. So um, basically the predicted phonetic trends from the dictionary data check out. And this makes the first part of this hypothesis plausible, right? Namely, um, these differences that we're seeing among and within rhythmic categories do appear to be correlated with differences in duration. Okay. So for the force choice task, um, stimuli were created from the forms in table one, and they differed only in suffixal stress. So examples were um, items like Quebecization versus Quebecization, um, Mexicanization versus Mexicanization. And to make this task kind of plausible, participants were told that they were helping a travel company pronounce words in new slogans. Um, so things like prepare for the Quebecization of your vacation. Okay. Um, what happened during the task is that participants heard a recording of the place name, so like Quebec, and then they chose between two possible pronunciations of the derivative. Okay. Um, the participants for this experiment, I recruited over Mechanical Turk. There were 50 of them. Um, all of them indicated that they were native speakers of English from the US and nobody's data was thrown out. Um, if we look at patterns in the data, it's really clear that the hypothesis is borne out. So first, um, distinctions among rhythmic categories are exactly what we would expect given the dictionary data and the acoustic results. So in the clash context, this is forms like um, Quebecization or Quebecization, um, I stress is preferred about 35% of the time. For the lapse context, so words like Austinization, I stress is preferred 39% of the time. And for the extended lapse context, I stress is preferred about 40% of the time. Okay, so that's talking about rhythmic context. Now thinking about duration. Um, the positive correlation that we see in figure three, so if you go down to um, page five here, you can see figure three. Um, this is entirely expected, right? So the longer the duration from the rightmost stem stress to eyes, the higher the rate of eye stress. So basically as eyes moves further and further away from that rightmost stress in the stem, people become more and more likely to prefer the form that has eyes stress. Okay. Interestingly, the statistics indicate that only duration and not rhythmic category played a role in participants' responses. Um, so the best fit mixed effects logistic regression model finds a significant effect for duration, as you can see in 14. So basically, this is just showing you that the trend that I in um, figure three is statistically significant. So basically, the longer the duration between the rightmost stem stress and eyes, the higher the likelihood of eye stress. And in addition, it finds an, an effect of the identity of the final segment. So basically, what this row is showing us in, table, in the table in 14 is that um, if the root ends, if the stem ends with an S, so something like Texas, people are more likely to choose the ization form. So Texasization versus Texasization. And you can think of it, this as a kind of OCP effect. So basically people don't wanna put the S's too close together. So they choose the form with a stressed or longer vowel to keep them a bit closer apart. Um, as with the corpus data, the frequency of the ization derivative and its eyes base don't appear to play a role in speaker responses. Um, and adding a predictor for rhythmic category, so this is clash versus lapse versus extended lapse, um, does not improve the fit of the model at all, um, nor does adding an interaction. And for those of you who might be wondering, the model that I just showed you in 14 um, does do better with respect to goodness of fit measures than does an equivalent model that replaces duration with rhythmic context. So here's what we can take away from these results. One, um, phonetic rhythmic information plays a role in speakers' judgments about whether or not to stress or de-stress eyes and ization. 
And second, and maybe more importantly, it's the duration between the last stem stress and eyes that matters. The rhythmic category that the form belongs to, that's clash, laps, or extended laps, only matters insofar as these categories are just shorthand for duration. Okay, moving on now to the production study. So for the production study, the stimuli were identical to those that I used in the forced choice task. So these are words like Quebecization, Mexicanization, and so on. And participants were again told that they were helping a travel company pronounce words and new slogans. So um, prepare for the Quebecization of your vacation. Um, participants, again, kind of like the forced choice task, they heard a recording of the place name. And then after this, they were expected or they were asked to pronounce the slogan aloud. So for this task, I had 57 participants recruited in a variety of ways. Um, all but one indicated that they were native speakers of English from the US. There was one Canadian whose data that I am excluding. And there are six additional speakers I am excluding because I don't think they were being truthful about their language background. Um, so the experiment took place over Zoom, like we're meeting right now. And participants were recorded to the cloud and compensated for their time. So thinking about kind of looking into what happened in this experiment, um, in the most of the cases, so about, let's say about 1,000 out of 1,500, um, there was no rhythmic modification of the item. So basically, they were given a form that looks like Quebecization without eye stress, and they pronounced it as Quebecization, OK? So I'm going to refer to this kind of pronunciation that doesn't have eye stress and doesn't have any sort of rhythmic modification as a default production. Um, I grouped non-default productions into four categories. So this is addition, deletion, stress shift, and eye stress. Um, ultimately, we're going to be interested in deletion and eye stress, though I'll go through addition and stress shift first. And just a note before moving on, it's possible for a single form to belong to more than one category. Um, so just to give an example of something that was pretty common, it's possible to exhibit deletion and eye stress at the same time. So instead of saying Indianapolisization, I had a lot of people giving me something like Indianapolization. Okay. So walking through what the four kinds of non-default productions were, uh, the first that I want to talk about is addition. So in addition, material is added to either the stem or the suffixal domain. And kind of common examples of addition were things like suffix doubling. So people would say francisization rather than francization or romanization instead of romanization. So they would turn um, something that wasn't a demonym into a demonym. The 61 items that exhibited addition were not evenly distributed by rhythmic context. And you can see this in 15. Um, most of the additions, so 51 out of 61, happened in the clash context. Um, so you can see that this is pretty clearly coming out here. So people are kind of happy in a sense to add material to words to items like bronxization. So I had one person give me bronxonization, um, but they really don't do this that often in any of the other contexts. Okay. This is independently interesting for rhythmic reasons. Um, addition doesn't really make sense from a rhythmic perspective. It takes a form that could exhibit perfect alternation. So something like Quebecization is rhythmically perfect and it gives it a lapse, right? So if you say something like Quebecization, um, you have a stress lapse where there didn't need to be one. But the fact that we find these errors rhythmically distributed suggests a sensitivity to the length of a stress lapse. What the suggestion is, is that lapse creation is okay, but lapse elongation is not. Um, I think that's all there is, rhythmically speaking, to what's going on with addition. Um, within the clash context, I don't think addition is conditioned by anything like rhythm at all. Um, this is due to the fact that romanization and existing demonym is the most frequent error. What I think is probably going on here is that there are some random errors, and then people are also just converting forms into demonyms that seem like they should have demonyms. Okay. The second type of repair that I want to talk about is stress shift. So in cases of stress shift, stress in the ization stem is realized differently than it is in isolation. For example, um, a common one was that people would say Egyptization instead of Egyptization. Okay. Stress shift was a little bit more common. It happened 101 times. And the 101 tokens that exhibited stress shift are concentrated mainly in four items. And you can see this in 16. Um, so stress shift was fairly common in Egyptization, so people pronounced it as Egyptization, 
um, Japanization, which was pronounced as Japanization, um, Icelandization, which was pronounced as Icelandization, and Rochesterization, which was pronounced as Rochesterization. Okay. So you might be wondering why these items. I have an explanation for some, but not all. Um, for Japanization, the way that many people said it, um, there is an eyes base that is stressed as Japanized, and this is how the OED stresses it. So my only real hypothesis is that some people know this word, or they are just um, using the stress of Japanese for reasons that I don't totally understand. Um, in the cases of Egyptization and Icelandization, in both cases, there's a relative here. So this is Egyptian and Icelandic that has this stress. And so what I think is going on here is that the Isation form is adopting the stress of these relatives. So e Egyptization sounds like Egyptian, Icelandization sounds like Icelandic in order to make the rhythmic profile of the word better. Um, and then finally, in Rochesterization, um, my guess here is that in, in some cases, speakers have a secondary stress on Rochester on the second syllable there, which is being promoted to a primary for the purposes of getting the stress just closer to the eyes. Um, so stress shift is interesting, but it's kind of orthogonal for my purposes because it's not governed by rhythm. So I'm going to move on now to deletion and eye stress, um, which are. So deletion is pretty straightforward. It's just deletion of stem or suffixal material. And to give you um, two examples that happened in the experiment. Um, so if you, if I had somebody read Madisonization, um, one person, or I think it was actually more than one person gave me Madisonization, so just deleting the it's. And then I also had a response Madisonation. So deletion can target the stem or it can target the suffix. Um, people kind of did whatever. Um, Deletion was relatively frequent, so it happened in about 10, it happened in about close to 11% of the items. Um, and deletion has a kind of relative, and I'm going to make it clear in a second in what ways these two are related, which is eye stress. So this is what we've been talking about so far. This is the pronunciation of this suffix um, I-Z-E as eyes. This was really frequent. So um, about 16% of the tokens had eye stress. But it's interesting to note that this wasn't evenly distributed across talkers. So most speakers were either consistent eye stressors, there were two of those, or consistent non-stressors, there were 33 of those, with fewer, so that is 15, showing any kind of variation. The reason I'm talking about these two together is that deletion and eye stress are really part of a conspiracy. Um, both of them act to reduce the amount of material between the rightmost stem stress and the suffixal stress. So thinking about an OT analysis, um, we can view the variation between them as variation in the ranking of max. So this is a constraint that assigns violations for deletion and star clash. So walking through what's in 18 here, if we just have the form Madisonization, this would violate star extended lapse because there is a sequence of three stressless syllables in a row. And then whether we get something like Madisonization that has eye stress or Madinization, which has deletion, is going to depend on the ranking of star clash and max. So basically, if star clash dominates max, then this is a speaker who really, really, really doesn't want to introduce a stress clash. So in order to kind of improve the rhythmic profile of the word, what they're going to do is just get rid of a syllable. So they'll have um, Madinization instead of Madisonization. If you flip them, and if max dominates star clash, then the winner here is going to be candidate A, Madisonization. So this would be a speaker who really doesn't want to delete material, but needs to kind of ameliorate this extended lapse in some way, so they stress eyes. So because of their similarity, I'm going to refer to these two together as rhythmic repair. And as the name suggests, um, rhythmic repair is distributed unevenly across rhythmic contexts. So in the clash context, so again, this is words like Quebecization, um, about 9% of tokens have deletion or eye stress. In the lapse context, so this is forms like Austinization, about 15% of the tokens exhibit it. And in the extended lapse context, so this is um, forms like Mexicanization, 24% of the tokens exhibit it. Unsurprisingly, the rate of rhythmic repair also tracks duration. So the longer the distance from the rightmost stem stress to the rightmost Oh, I don't know why that rightmost is there. Okay. From the rightmost stem stress to the stem boundary, um, the more likely rhythmic repair is. And you can see this pretty clearly 
in figure four here. So this is um, at the top of page seven. Okay. So as with the forced choice task, the statistics indicate that duration is a better model of participants' behavior than is rhythmic context. So the best fit model for this task um, includes um, predictors for duration, identity of the final segment, frequency of the base, and frequency of the derivative. So walking you through exactly what this model is showing, basically this gigantic effect for duration is telling us that as the duration from the rightmost stem stress to eyes increases, the rate of deletion and eye stress also increase. The second effect here, this final S effect, is the OCP effect we talked about earlier. So if the stem final consonant is an S, people are more likely to delete something or stress the eyes. The effect of derivative frequency here is telling us that as the derivative becomes more frequent, so some of these are existing forms like cubanization, um, people are less likely to stress eyes. And the effect for base frequency is telling us that as the base becomes more frequent, so some of these are existing bases like Japanese or um, cubanized, um, eye stress becomes more frequent. Again, like the forced choice task, um, adding a predictor to this model for rhythmic context does not result in an improvement of fit, nor does adding an interaction. And as was true for the forced choice task too, if we substitute um, rhythmic context for the duration factor in this model in 19, it does worse on measures of goodness of fit. So um, what we can conclude from these is that eye stress and eyesation forms is rhythmically conditioned. And importantly, that rhythmic constraints need to be defined in a more fine-grained way than is typically assumed in theories of stress if we want to be able to account for these findings. And I've shown you a couple of sources of evidence for these conclusions, namely dictionary data from the OED, um, results from a forced choice task, which show that participants' judgments are influenced by duration and not really categorical rhythmic information. And finally, results from a production study, which show the same. So the results from section three support the hypothesis, namely the longer the distance between the rightmost stem stress and eyes, the more likely eyes is to be stressed. And analytically speaking, these results support the addition of phonetic rhythmic constraints defined over duration to con. But there are a lot of questions that remain about how exactly these constraints should be defined, as well as what kinds of representations they evaluate. Um, so we could pursue a kind of more concrete definition, which is that the, the um, kind of output representation is tagged with the number of milliseconds that it takes. And these constraints like lapse and clash are defined over milliseconds and evaluate those representations. We could also entertain a more abstract definition, like maybe constraints evaluate normalized duration, or maybe segments are kind of chunked up into little durational categories according to how long they are, and constraints can kind of access this information and refer to it. Um, <clears throat> results from a second forced choice task that I'm going to show you now suggest that a more abstract definition is appropriate, and I'll sketch a possible one that's based on these results in a second. So the second forced choice task worked just like the first one, um, except it used half of the ization items from the original task. So you can see in table two here which items were included. It was in all other ways identical in terms of design and recruitment and participants. Um, for this experiment, two versions of each item were used. In the first version, both forms were presented at the normal speech rate. And in the second version, the forms were slowed by 20%. So this is enough slowing to where it's noticeable, but um, it's not enough to where it sounds awkward or unnatural. The prediction here is that if phonetic clash is defined in terms of milliseconds, we would expect to find a stronger preference for eye stress in the slowed forms, right? Because the distance between the rightmost stem stress to eyes is longer. Um, the results are very clear, however, and do not support this prediction at all. So first we can ask ourselves, you know, are the participants doing something reasonable? Does the result from experiment one replicate? And the answer is yes. Um, duration in this task was again, a significant predictor of eye stress. And as you can see in figure five over here, this trend was visible in both the normal and the slowed forms. So in both cases, as you go, as you increase the duration between the rightmost stem stress and eyes, the percentage of responses with eye stress increases. Um, here too, adding rhythmic context doesn't improve fit, um, nor does adding anything about frequency or, or the identity of the final segment. Um, and unsurprisingly, 
kind of if we look at figure six here, what we find is that the rate of eye stress really did not vary at all between the normal and the slowed context. So it really didn't matter whether the form was produced at its original rate or whether it was artificially slowed, people were likely to, se to select um, eyes or not eyes at approximately the same rate. And so unsurprisingly, item type is not a significant predictor and adding it to the model does not improve the fit. So the takeaway from kind of this task is that phonetic rhythmic constraints likely assess violations at a more abstract level than raw duration. So the results of this task do limit the hypothesis space as to how phonetic rhythmic constraints are defined, but the hypothesis space is still really quite large. Um, so we could think of a couple of possibilities and you can brainstorm more if you want. Um, one is that perhaps each segment is associated with an idealized duration stored as milliseconds and rhythmic constraints reference this idealized duration. A second possibility could be that segments are split up into durational categories and rhythmic constraints reference these durational categories. Um, for the sake of analysis, I'm going to pursue this second possibility, though of course further work is necessary to verify that this is in fact the, the right way to go. So first working out what the definitions of these constraints are. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to define phonetic clash as the following. Um, so star clash um, takes a pair of stress vowels, V1 and V2, and it assigns a base violation score of one. And for each segment between the stressed vowel one and the stress vowel two, um, multiply the violation score by one over X, where X is valued according to A through B. So um, on average, I found in um, this and also, uh, and also other work that obstruents are longer than sonorants. So sonorants get a category of three, sorry, obstruents get a category of three and sonorants get a category of two. So for Quebecization, we calculate the score for clash by adding one third plus one third, because here we have one clash that involves an obstruent and a second clash that also involves an obstruent. For Texasization, this is a bit more complicated because these first two stresses, the et and the i, are separated by three obstruents, k, s, and s. So for the first clash, the violation score is one third times one third times one third. And then we add to that the violation score of one third um, for this z that's in between the i and the a, and we get 10 over 27. In addition to phonetic clash, we should also consider the possibility that phonetic lapse plays a role in speakers' judgments. Um, so in items like Texasization versus Mexicanization, it's possible that the preference for more eye stress on the latter is due to a phonetic version of lapse, which just prefers longer lapses. So I've defined phonetic lapse here basically as the inverse of phonetic clash. Um, so the version of phonetic lapse says for each pair of stress vowels V1 and V2, um, assign a base violation score of one. And for each segment between these stressed vowels, multiply the violation score by X, where X is valued according to A through B, and we have the same kind of durational category scale as we had earlier. So for Quebecization, the violation score is going to be six because we have one place where an obstruent is between the two stresses and a second place where there's an obstruent between the two stresses. For Texasization, we're going to have a violation score of 30 because we have one lapse that has three obstruents, so that's three times three times three, plus a second lapse that has one obstruent, so that's plus three, which gives you 30. Um, I'm gonna skip this part at the bottom of nine here, but what I basically wanna kind of reinforce here is that what's really important about how these constraints are defined is the idea. So the strength of the violation is correlated with the distance between two stresses. Um, I'm not married to these precise formulations, they can be revised. So to demonstrate how a partial analysis of these data could work, I'm going to consider four items and their realizations from the fourth choice task. This is Quebecization, Francization, Texasization, and Mexicanization. And for an analysis of these results, I'm going to include the following constraints. Um, stress eyes, which we saw earlier, star clash as it's defined over here in 21, and star lapse as it's defined over here in 22. Um, I use the Maxent grammar tool to find weights for the above constraints, given the candidates and the violation scores that I calculated in table three. So you can, um, after this talk, you can check my math if you want and let me know if I got anything wrong. 
Um, but the tool finds the weights in 26, so basically it assigns a pretty high weight to clash, a lower weight to stress eyes, and a lower weight still to star laps, and it makes the predictions in 27. And what I want you to notice, kind of looking across 27, is that the predicted and observed values are pretty close to one another, meaning that this model does a pretty good job of fitting the results for these four items. So kind of the main takeaway from all of this is that phonetic versions of clash and lapse play a role in judgments of eye stress, um, rhythm drives variation. So um, what I hope to have convinced you of is that gradient or phonetically informed versions of lapse and clash are necessary to account for the full range of rhythmic effects in English. And the supporting evidence that I've shown you here comes from stress in English words that end in ization. There's a very similar case um, that happens in a TIV, which I've written a different paper about. So you might be wondering why the heck I'm spending all this time talking about ization. What, what's special about words that end in this way? Um, one of the things that's special about it is that words ending in ization, as well as words that end in a TIV, um, are one of the corners of the English lexicon where evidence for phonetic rhythm is most easily available. So. Um, Clashes and lapses are in principle allowed in these forms. So forms in ization, like forms in a TIV, are largely stress preserving. So when we have something like um, channel plus ization, we get channelization, not channelization, right? When we have something like Mexican plus ization, we have Mexicanization or Mexicanization, not Mexicanization, which sounds completely ridiculous. Um, something else that's kind of special about ization is that this inner suffix eyes has a stressed and a stressless form. So it has eyes and is. And the realization of these can thus depend on something like rhythmic context. Another kind of interesting fact about words in ization, um, like words in a TIV, is that they're really infrequent. Um, kids, when they're growing up, are not hearing a lot of words in ization. And so I find this interesting because it implies that it must be the case that evidence for phonetic rhythm is way more widespread in English than we've seen here. Um, so I'm kind of begun a hunt for other potential sources of evidence. One of these I think is English post-tonic syncope, which we already know is rhythmically conditioned. So we can say separate instead of separate, but we cannot say separate instead of separate. So basically if syncope would induce a clash, you don't syncopate. Um, another potential source is the English rhythm rule, which um, Bruce Hayes wrote about, and there's a, an appendix to his 1986 paper. So these results add to a growing base of evidence that rhythmic constraints pay greater attention to duration than is commonly assumed. Um, I've just talked about English here. There have been little snatches of evidence from other languages that something like this holds. Um, so these are here for your reference, but I wanna just conclude by noting that all of this work that I've discussed here um, is consistent with a broader view in which stress placement is directly informed by phonetics. Thank you. Thank you. So, if you have a, a question or comment, please uh, send me your name and affiliation. Uh, using the chat window, I just sent a chat uh, to everyone. Uh, so we will start uh, with uh, Shigeto Kawahara from uh, Keihyo University. This is great. Thank you so much for the talk. So I was wondering if you had, so you, you talked about two possibilities in section 4.2. Oh, and I was wondering if you have um, a yet alternative possibility, which is that we know that we normalize perceived duration, right? Mm -hmm. so we constantly um, take into account the speech rate and normalize the raw duration to perceive a length contrast, for example. So instead of talking about absolute physical milliseconds, can we talk about perceived normalized duration? Yeah, so I'm really glad you asked this question because I did some work to address it yesterday, actually. All right. <laughs> I'd like to hear about <laughs> so it. <laughs> that, did, that did not make its way into the handout. But um, so what I did was instead of modeling the results of the experiments by using kind of the raw duration between the eye stress and the eight, mm -hmm. sorry, between the rightmost stem stress and the eyes, 
what I modeled was the ratio of the overall um, stressless material of in you know in comparison to the entire form. I so see. this meant that if the form was slow, the ratio was still going to be the same. Right, right, right. And actually, the models that I fit to the data were completely indistinguishable from the models that are presented here, in terms of goodness of fit. So I. Basically, what I want to say is that I believe that the hypothesis that you brought up is just as plausible as the one that I'm entertaining here. Um, in a paper version of this, what I'm planning to do is kind of lay out both of them and present hypotheses for both and formalize kind of ways that an OT grammar could refer to both of these notions. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a real possibility that that's the way things work. So thanks for asking that. All right, great, thanks. Yes, uh, do we have any question? Maybe this is, uh, can I ask, uh, it's not a theoretical question, but more like a, a, your production test, uh, uh, but uh, can you elaborate a little bit about how it was like when you were, uh, because a lot of people now have to move on to like online kind of testing for foreseeable future. Uh, so like, uh, you recorded yeah. directly on Zoom. Uh, uh -huh. So how was that? Uh, yeah, for... It worked surprisingly well. So I was I was really worried when I kind of started recording people that I was going to have issues with connectivity, that I was going to have issues with bad microphones, garbled productions, you know, like all these kinds of things. Okay. But um, in the end, uh, so I have a kind of a caveat here that I'll, I'll give you in a second. But in the end, there were only four tokens that I really, really could not understand, which out of like 1500 is pretty striking. Mm -hmm. um, the caveat is that what I was doing was pretty coarse grained, right? So I'm just listening to see was the vowel I or was the vowel uh? Mm -hmm. And that's something that's very easy to do kind of off of Zoom recording. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that I would have wanted to use these recordings for anything that required like fine phonetic analysis because there were occasionally like little glitches in the recording where I could definitely hear that the vowel was still I or uh, but if I wanted to get like a durational measurement off of it, it would be kind of useless. Mm -hmm. um, so overall, like I would say the experience using Zoom and recording off of it was really fine for kind of the task I was running and what I wanted to get out of it. Yeah, that's, thank you. Yeah, uh, it's mm -hmm. good to hear. Uh, uh, I think other people might take that as well for their own experiment. Uh, so do we have any other follow-up questions? I guess people ask to... another question. If people... Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the fact that you found segmental deletion in response to this rhythmic requirement sounds a little striking to me. I think um, people often think about, okay, we have segments and we build stress around it, but we don't really mess around with the segments to accommodate stress patterns. Do you have right. some thoughts? Of, or is this something that we would find more examples of if we look or Right, that's a good question. Um, I haven't really thought about this in any detail, but I I have noticed that it's it's not like it doesn't surprise me, I guess, because I've seen hints of um, other. Um, effects that are kind of like this in English. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to come up with examples off the top of my head. But the OED, for example, will sometimes record um, gliding in a context where gliding would improve the rhythmic profile of the word. Um, and then it will record no gliding in a context where it wouldn't improve the rhythmic profile of the word, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is I wasn't completely surprised by this because I've seen evidence in the dictionary of um, other 
little kinds of effects where stress placement does seem to affect how certain segments are produced, like as a glide or a vowel. Um, but it's a good question. I do need to think about that more. Great, thanks. John, if, seems to have a question. Yeah, John had the question. Uh, you can say it uh, as well, but like I will first read it. Maybe you can address it. Uh, sure, John, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, you, yeah, should we be surprised at how shallow the slope of the fit is? That's what John asks. So, you yeah, can, so go back to the first figure. Um, or either of those. Um, yeah, this yeah. one. Yeah. I mean, if duration is has as profound an effect on the likelihood of, of an I's pronunciation, um, do would you expect this this shallow an increase in the in the likelihood um, uh, given the rather large magnitude of the, of the duration difference? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. So. I think it's an open question whether or not there are other factors that affect how eyes is stressed. Um, one thing that I don't think has been investigated is to what extent eye stress is like regionally dependent or socially dependent or anything like this. So just anecdotally, I um, do know that Canadian speakers are pretty likely to stress eyes every single time. That's why I excluded the one speaker who was Canadian. Um, so I guess my answer to your question is really, um, I don't know um, if I should be surprised by this or not. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, Suyeon Yun has a question. Uh, uh, please go ahead. So, yeah. Sorry, I thought, uh, yeah, it is on me. Uh, hi, Juliet. Uh, uh, it's good to see you and I really enjoyed your talk. And I have a couple of clarification questions. So do you see the stress is assigned to a vowel, not to a syllable, right? Yeah, that's what I'm assuming for the purposes of making measurements, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I was wondering if you find any fine-grained within category uh, durational difference between like stops and fricatives or voice stops and voiceless stops or something like that and for the clusters and standard and obstruent clusters and obstruent and obstruent clusters and things like that. Yeah, so um, I can speak about this from the perspective of working on a TIV because I more carefully controlled segmentals when I was working on a TIV. And there definitely are more fine grained differences. So, you know, it's definitely the case, unsurprisingly, right, that voice stops are shorter than voiceless stops and voice fricatives are shorter than voiceless fricatives and like N is shorter than M and kind of all of this stuff. Um, kind of interestingly, though, I didn't find differences like these um, regularly represented in the dictionary data or in the forced choice data at all. So in the ATIV task, it kind of looked like there was a division between sonar and obstruent and people were aware of that and their responses reflected that, but anything finer grain than that kind of got washed out. Now, I, I, I wanna be cautious about saying this because it could be that if I ran a different experiment that was just looking at sonorants, for example, I might find an effect of duration, um, but so far, I haven't found any indication that people are sensitive to those kinds of differences. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, thank uh, Juliet uh, for nice talk. Thank you one more time. And uh, uh, please uh, uh, stop the recording now. <laughs>